we're starting the first class of the Tishuvah series that we do from now oh. until Sukkot. And I, I was really, I didn't know what book we were going to use. Um, I still don't know what book we're going to use. Uh, I was hoping to be home earlier, but um, you know, sometimes people have troubles and they don't schedule those troubles beforehand. So I had to be with those people who were having troubles. I thought the Shem and get sorted out soon. So I come to the Knesset and I said, you know, we still don't have our library set up here. What books do I possibly have in the Knesset? Like Hashem, you gotta help me find the book that we should study. And uh, the book that came to my hand was the Chuvar Talmudim, the Student's Obligations. It's a book written by Rabbi oh. Klonimus Kalmish Shapira, otherwise known as the Rebbe of Pia Setzna. Say that. Pia Setzna Rebbe. We've studied about We've studied right. him. Uh, right when I first first got yeah, here, about the Christians, if they're idol Pesach worshipers. Time. We, no, that wasn't when we studied him. We studied him about the holiness of singing and of Pesach and of... Uh, we did some Kabbalah of Pesach. We were doing that during Pesach here. I remember. I, I just... This is the first Jewish book I ever owned. All right. Though. Meaning, I had books that my parents had in the house and the Sidurim. The first time I ever decided to study Torah on my own, I was going to Yeshiva, I was 13 years old. I'd met a Hasidic Rebbe by the name of the Biala Rebbe. <coughs> and uh, I asked, what book should I learn? He said, you should learn a book called the Chobar Talmidim. The student's obligation. And now you're in San Diego looking for a Chobar Talmidim. Today they have the English, Hebrew English on Amazon, but back then there was no yeah, Amazon and, for it. and there were no really Hebrew books that could be found here, and so I had to wait till my summer trip to Israel. And we were in Israel, and I went to a bookstore and I bought a Chobar Tamidim, and I sat down to open it, and all the Hebrew that I had spoken in my life, and all the preparation that I had in my life, didn't prepare me to study a work of Hasidut on my own at 13 years old. And so I carried this book around in Yeshiva, 14, 15, 16. Essentially, this book got me through high school. And this book was written for Yeshiva students. It was written for young people. And this Rebbe, the Klan Miskam Shapira, I spoke about him then. I don't want to talk about him so much now because many of you know of him. He was the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto. He was murdered by the Nazis in Mashram Zichan. And he was part of a very special Hasidic lineage. His yeshiva was for young people. His chasidut was for young people. When, when parents used to bring their kids to get brachot, he wouldn't bless the parents, only bless the kids. You already have a rebbe. This kid, there's no rebbe in the world yet for kids. You know, someone is, kids have to have a rebbe also. And he was like the rebbe of, of the youth. Some of the things that he writes for yeshiva students, you wonder if he's living in 2017. Like, it doesn't make sense that in the Warsaw Ghetto, somebody was thinking about the problems that our youth are facing today. Yeah. It's very relevant. And because those problems are so relevant, this book saw recently, in the last few years, an English translation happened to it. It's been introduced to some yeshiva that are not even Hasidic. They studied this book. And he always had a special place in my heart. Uh, Humble, like they come, holy as they come, and real, a real Hasid, a real Rebbe. But I have to tell the truth, and this is not a hard, it's not an easy truth for me to admit. And that uh, truth is, that whereas I used to be very involved in the study of Hasidut for many years of my life, I distanced myself from that, half consciously and half subconsciously. The conscious part of me was, listen, you know, it's nice, I want to learn a lot of things, but before I know the basics well, I can't study things that are not essential. What do I mean essential? Everything is essential. But I need to know Tanakh first, I have to know the Talmud first, I have to know the Rambam first, Shukhan first. I, I have to know the things that everyone has to know, and then I could decide, you know, study Hasidut, study Kabbalah, study, all those things are nice once you have, let's say, imagine going to buy tires for the car you don't own. Of course you need tires, but you don't even own a car yet. First get a car, how do you get a car? Save the money, so first you first have to get a job, so okay, the thing, but the first thing you do is not walk into discount tires and order four tires for the car you don't have yet. So many people in Judaism are buying accessories for their cars. They're buying um, you know, covers for the seats or a special stereo system for something they don't even have. So it's, oh, I, I'm this. I'm Breslev. I'm Chabad. I'm that. They tell you names. They say, wait, are you first? First, did you finish the Jewish part yet? So do you know that you have to wash your hands before you eat an olive? Very good. No, very good. This is, this is the... I mean, halachot, Torah. You can ask the person, tell me the name of ten great rabbis. Yes. Tell me the name of ten biblical personalities. Not that have to be great ones, just just not great ones. Uh, oh, man. Really? I was once a group of yeshiva students. Tell me, who was King Chizkiyahu? Mm. 
Chisinau, King Chisinau, is the most famous of the Jewish kings. Perhaps even, I'm not saying God forbid, David and Shlomo, you can't compare kings, but David and Shlomo were, were obviously the kings of Israel. But Chizkiyahu had a period in Jewish history which has still been unparalleled. Even the little kids on the street, you would ask them a question, they knew how to answer you a question on halakha. As a yeshiva guys, do you know who Chizkiyahu HaMelech was? No. So I told them. Okay, do you know? They say they're being a Mashiach. They say they're very good. That's how important it was. He could have been the Mashiach. Do you know which prophet was alive in the time of Chizkiyahu? Now, it's not as it, there, there are questions that Tanakh would ask me. Also, don't know. You're nitpicking names, you know, like a random name from the back of Tanakh. Fine, I'm not being. This is like uh, Yeshayahu, very good. Yeshayahu, the prophet. Two weeks later, I gave a tour of Jerusalem to a group of German Christian missionaries. They know all. They know everything. I mentioned Chizkiyahu, they already told me which book it is, which prophet already spoke. And I said, Woe to the embarrassment, the shame, that there's people who stole our books from us, and they know the books they stole better than we who wrote them. That should, that should make us cringe. And I, I mean that. So I took a period in my life where I said, okay, no, i got to focus on what other people call basics, but, you know, like the Rav Chaz, the basics are things that everyone needs to know, but nobody knows. That's basics. Mm. And... Now when I study the things that came later, it all makes sense, because now I understand the background of everything. And there was a second part, and that was more subconscious, and that was, uh, I had some negative experiences with the Hasidic community. And it's not fair to, what does Hasidic have to do with Hasidim? It really doesn't. The truth is that, why, why do, you know, if someone says, don't study Judaism from Jews. Yeah, but at the end of the day, they're the only people who pretend to be Jewish. So if the Jewish people mess up on something, they messed up in the name of Judaism like it or not. I know it's nice to divorce the two, but it's not fair. And this this dissonance between how could it be that I found the Torah of rabbis like the Baal Shem Tov, like Rabbi Yitzhak Abedice, like Rabbi Nachman and Brasen, like the Lubavitch Rebbe, and I find their Torah to be sweeter than honey. But my experiences with many, not all, not all, there's nobody all, with many of those communities has been some of the most bitter in my entire life. That, that, I just couldn't, I couldn't always bridge that gap. And there was a part of me that for the last few years just, it wouldn't find me dead giving a class. And just, and you never know, maybe somebody had that same experience, vice versa. I have no, absolutely. Yeah. I, that's, I'm not coming from a place of judging. I'm, uh, me, Yonatan Halevi, yeah. personally struggled. And today I could tell you that I'm not in that place where I'm out of, I'm not out in the clear, but I appreciate being able to study these texts again from an independent place from place of, okay, now that I've studied what I feel that I need to know, and now that I'm in a healthier relationship with these texts and the authors who wrote these texts, and I'm aware of the, the flaws and, and the pitfalls and the things that I struggle with, now these texts become much more real to me. Now it becomes just a real text. It's not a fantasy anymore. It's not a, oh, wow, the Hasidina. And now it's, it's, I don't anymore read these writings and say, if I don't study Hasidut, Mashiach won't come. That's not my motivation anymore for studying Hasidut. That was once upon a time. But today it's, I'm studying Hasidut because I believe this is part of the Jewish canon. This is part of the texts of Jewish of the Jewish faith that, that cannot be ignored. You cannot consider yourself an educated, well-rounded Jew who lives today in the year 2017 and not know Hasidut. It's a, and someone who says that, you should judge them. Judge them. How could you cut out such a big section of the Jewish community? And so today I'm coming back to read this place. I don't have any baggage with the PSS. He, was, he got me through the, everything that I needed to. But the PSS Rebbe wrote a book in Hebrew, in simple Hebrew, in good Hebrew, in, in emotional Hebrew. This book is written not in a text-based style. It's written as if he was speaking to somebody. All the, all the pages here, my son, my child, my friend, my student, my, he's talking to us. Don't think I'm trying to be so... Di- he re- Which book did you ever read? It's like a textbook on geometry. And then halfway through the textbook, the author says, My dear students, I'm sorry if it's so complicated until now. I apologize if what I've told you until today may be difficult for you to understand. But please trust me that I love you so much that I'm going to get you through the next three chapters. Never. You don't ever see books like that. That's exactly how this book is written. And it's almost a crime to read this book out of order. But there are parts of this book that are relevant to tshuva. They're relevant to elul. They're relevant to becoming a better person, which is what we're trying to accomplish here. And so, if you want a copy of this book, I recommend it highly. You don't need it, I'll be reading to you. 
Uh, but if you would like a copy, I really recommend it. It's called The Student's Obligation. Or The Student's Obligation. Or, 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 it's called The Student's Obligation. And it's published by Feldheim. Feld? Feldheim. H E I N. So says the PSS and the Rebbe. This is the third chapter of this book. Me'ikarei machalot ha-nefesh. These are the main spiritual diseases. Utrufotehen, and their cures, their medication. He's now going to list, before he gets into the details, and we're not going to do those details, we're going to read the first chapter and a chapter from much later. What are the main spiritual illnesses that people have? And how do you cure them? Um, apathy, I would say, would be one of them, right? Apathy, he does talk a lot. He actually calls it, um, you could, you could, he talks about atzlut, vihitraput. You can call that laziness, you can call that, uh, they, they translate here, uh, lethargic, you know, being lethargic in your observance. Uh, what was the word they used? Apathy. apathy. It's the same, it's, it's, it's a like numbness, that. it's a certain, like, I don't really care so much. Well, that I mean, attitude, that's definitely, that's the next chapter, chapter four. Laziness. But here, this is the background of, listen, we have to do tshuva, but before we do tshuva, we have to understand, like, what's the problem first? You know, the first step in, in Alcoholics Anonymous is to admit I'm an alcoholic. If I think that I'm not, so no therapy in the world is going to get me through it. But even then, you still have, like, you have to not be lethargic about it. Like, eh, whatever. Like, Who cares? Whatever. Right. Yeah. So he says, Kevan, since shekol tachliteinu hu lekorevcha, letorah uvederch Hashem tenech, because our whole purpose, this book is written in Ashkenazi Hebrew, so... Not always do the sentences flow the same way we would speak Hebrew today. And that doesn't make a difference. But just so you should know if I get confused. Since our entire goal is to bring you closer to Torah and to Hashem's path, who is our? His. His. It's very normal for rabbis to speak about themselves in the third person, especially in the Hasidic community. Speaking to a rabbi in third person, that could actually be a halakha. But sp- the rabbi speaks about himself, the stolen Rebbe, for example, my wife's Rebbe, he speaks about himself in the room. We would like oh, to come visit you. We would. Thing, right? oh, yeah, um, it's not an I. Who's I? I is like. Uh, right. You said you just. Oh, I, I, I mentioned about it. Just, I mentioned yeah. about this. When they used we, I thought they were referring to the Jewish people as a whole. Right. And it, sometimes it is that way. That's why I'm, that's why I'm explaining here oh, okay. what the story is. Kivan shakol tachlitenu. This is the whole purpose. Lachen zachim ana anach lachshi utcha kifi shahorta lanu atorah batzma. Therefore, we have to prepare you in the same way the Torah commanded us. How do you prepare a student? Wait, what was his entire purpose? To bring us closer to the Torah and to Hashem's path. It says, therefore, how does the Torah suggest that we come close to Hashem? In the words of King David, in Tehillim 34, he says, Sur mera vaseto. You have to leave evil and do good. I apologize. Do you think? Do you think you can just start doing good before you leave evil? We had a historian staying in my house. He didn't come here for Shabbat, but he's a historian from the Chassidut of my wife. A guy who was a Rosh Hashiva for a long time. He was a very learned person. Always interested in more than just what the texts say. You know, the history of the Hasidic movement, the history of the Jewish people. And so he started in doing independent research. He didn't. No one ever went to high school. Never went to college. Never went to like his. Academia is purely yeshiva. And he doesn't even speak English. And he started researching on his own. He's been researching for years. And after he retired, he opened up his own office, and the Rebbe of Stalin appointed him as the historian of the community. Wow. And so he publishes articles every month, and you know, he's in the same like age range and the same neighborhood he grew up with my father-in-law. So old Yerushalmi Stoliners. Not, they're not a New Yorker. He's, he's Yerushalmi. And so he randomly came here to a convention. They, someone heard about his research in the University of San Francisco or University of Berkeley, something like that. And they asked him to come meet with them. And they came. He was so impressed with his man that they asked him to come address. They had a, a library convention of Jewish librarians here in San Diego, like hundreds of librarians. They did in downtown, the convention center. And they invited him to come speak in one of the panels. And he didn't speak English. So he came with the tra- they flew him from Israel, they brought him there, he gave a lecture, they translated sentence by sentence for him, and he spent the whole three days there. 
And he, he, even though he had a hotel room, he'd come sleep by us in my house. He, he, they saw a picture of the stolen Arabic and a Jewish bookcase. I, I'm not gonna lie to you. He, like this, like I said, you know, he came to the house. He pulled up a chair next to the Rebbe's picture with his books, and he stayed there all night. I said, for me, I can't sleep in a hotel. I need a picture of the Rebbe. And I need especially my books. What did this is the not with the two new Bible. Right, especially not with the you know the what, Book of Mormon, the New Testament, and the drawers over there in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we had a fascinating conversation. He actually just put out an article. He writes in Hebrew. And they're free online. His articles. An article about the difference in the Hasidic movement. There was a war about how to deal with teshuva. Some rabbi said that you have to really first leave evil and then do good. In the dynasty of Karlin and Stolin, their whole approach was that if you spend so much time leaving evil, you've actually never really left evil. You've, you're still in evil. Meaning if you're trying to fix what was bad, then you never left it. You're still involved in it. And their whole thing is, no, first do good and then, then fit. Mimela, when you do good, so you stop doing evil anyway. <laughs> that was, and other Hasidic Rebbe's accused the stolen Rebbe's of, that's avoiding the issue. You didn't deal with the issue, you just moved forward. And this is a war, I don't know who's right and who's wrong, but definitely I feel that perhaps in our generation, that approach of, you know, all the days, the Mekubalim did tshuva, for every Avilah they did, they fasted for 81 days, they rolled over in the snow, they, they crazy things they did. I think every generation has its own way that it does to Shuvan. I'm not sure that, that that way is still relevant for many people, not everyone, for many people today. I say, like, like you were talking about uh, uh, Rebbe Pettitz. Yeah. Like, he said, like you said one time, he got real stressed out because he was like, man. And he was like really stressed and he asked him what was wrong. He's like, I spent 25 minutes that one time reading the newspaper. It's like, there's different levels of. Level, very good. That's, shu- that's shu- true. You know, and different. You know, sometimes for us, it's just doing good is the shuvah, you know? So maybe to complicate this conversation, you should know the father-in-law of the Piasets and the Rebbe was a Hasid of Karlin, of Stone. He was the same Hasid as my wife. Whoa. Yeah, I didn't know that even until they put out the English edition. The English edition has a biography about him. Mm. And many of his customs he took from his father-in-law, which tells you which wow. tells you that not all your customs have to come from your parents. It's, it's okay, and we've seen this many times in Jewish history, to take customs from one's wife's family. That's a normal thing that was always done in the Jewish people. Makes sense. You're, if your father was a Tamil Khan, he was a Hasid Rebbe, <laughs> for what purpose? Just because he wasn't your dad, so you can't accept the good practices that he does? Of course you can. Of course. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, very, you know, that's what I'm saying. After this, today people have this thing, well, your dad didn't do it. I don't know, my dad, he didn't even know what Shabbat looked like, so, Baruch Hashem, I did, but, so what, what difference does it make if now I'm doing Shabbat and I'm doing it in a, in a Ashkenazi way, I'm doing it in a Yemeni way, who cares? So you, we upgraded and we took whatever Min Hagim felt relevant to us. This Yemeni Pesach is the best one that to That was the deal. Ki yifshar l'achnis et ha-melech, you cannot bring the king into a room, bilti im naki et ha-cheder mitchada, unless the room was clean first. You can't invite guests into your house unless your, your house has room for them. You can't possibly expect your body to become holy if you're still in filth, if you're still in the gutter. We have to find any, any dirt inside of you. Shemitz? Any, anything. You know the word shmutz in Yiddish? That's a perversion of a Hebrew word. Any deficiency, any any dirt that's inside of you says it's our job, I mean the Rebbe's job, to come in and cleanse you of that. Before what? Before you can even begin to go up on the ladder of holiness. Aval, but, but. Now this is what I tell you. Nobody writes a geometry book like this. Rakim chayachan nechapes. said, I'm not going to do this alone. I'm not going to stand here and tell you, do this, don't do that. I'm doing this together with you. This is a joint effort, says, says the P.S. Rebbe. Yes, when you're sitting in yeshiva, when I was in yeshiva, the Rosh Yeshiva, to this day, does not shake the student's hands on Shabbat. You can't touch the Rosh Yeshiva. He's not a human being. It's considered disrespectful to say Shabbat Shalom. Really? No. Now, for me, that's like the exact opposite. What do you mean? Now, I understand. I understand that world. I understand. I'm not putting it down here. For me, that approach of, you know what? Let me put my arm around you and help you get to yeshiva together. Nobody was offering that in yeshiva, but the P.S. doesn't remember was. A Rebbe who was murdered in the Holocaust and was dead, but on paper, he was saying, I want to put my arm around you and help you. That attitude of a rabbi was what helped me through yeshiva. And together we have to search. I can't look in you alone. You know yourself better than I do. I have to find the crumbs of chametz. What is this an allusion to? 
Pesach. Pesach. We know when we put around the chametz. We know where it is. You know where your chametz is. I don't. I need your help. If I'm going to help you, I need your help to tell me where did you hide those pieces of chametz? Where did you put them? And the, the, the root, the, 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 the rot that is inside of you. Which is to destroy it. Who is your main educator, if not yourself? This is the This approach to Judaism in general is empowering. The P.S. Setzner Rebbe was a master educator. If I ever to open up a school, this would be a mandatory text that every teacher had to live by. You don't like it? You don't want to empower your students? You don't want to put your arm around somebody and get them to the finish line? Get out. We don't need it. You have to tell a person, you're... We expect we're going to send our kids to school and our kids are going to be molded into... You have to teach your child. You're responsible for yourself. For the good and for the bad. When you get an accomplishment, before you say thank you to your teacher, say thank you to your kid. You know, there are other kids in this class that didn't do what you did. You held on to something. Give them thank you also. Then go say thank you to the teacher. The main educator is the child himself. And when someone's in trouble, it's not always the teacher's fault that your kid's in trouble. It's not always the parent's fault that the kids do something wrong. Sometimes it's just the kids are just not good kids. The main educator is us ourselves. And my rabbi always said when you read these parts where he talks to the yeshiva students, don't get hung up that he's talking to yeshiva students. He's talking to us also. He just wrote this book for yeshiva students. He said, you, are, you have the potential to become a giant of Torah. Literally, the cedar trees of the Jewish community, the cedar trees of Lebanon. He says, you know yourself better than anybody, both your positive side and your negative side. Who can I rely on except for you to help me? He says, you have spiritual distortions inside of you. But it's a distortion. You know when light, I'm not the engineer, but I can give you a better When light, light reflects through a glass or a crystal, it gets distorted. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but your spirituality was coming in. It was a good Torah that you studied. It was a good rabbi you accepted. It was good parents you had, but it got distorted somewhere inside of you. Only you know where it went. Only you know the problems. Every person has different problems. I remember when I was once in the Shivan, a rabbi, all he could talk about was, you're not studying enough Torah. Too many hours in your day, you're not studying Torah. And I'm thinking, now some of these guys, studying Torah is not their biggest issue here. Man, there are problems here. These guys have problems. There are, you know, there's girls, there are drugs, there's uh, bad things that people are looking at, all kinds of things that are going on. And all you could talk to them about is, you have two hours a night, why are you not studying Gemara? You know? The Barosha, it's not his fight. Maybe, maybe the other guy, that's what he's struggling with. But in order to be an educator, in order to come do tshuva, you have to say, my problem is not his problem. Her problem is not my problem. And I have to know, if I'm going to be honest, we can all pretend that we're one community, we're all one family, we all have the same problems to fix. That's cute, that's nice, put your arms together, kumbaya, that's good. But I have problems that nobody knows about. I have problems that I'm even afraid to admit. Last year we studied Rasul of Echik And Rasul of Echik said half of the Chuvah process is being able to get out of your mouth the vidui, the confession. And I, we all know what we did wrong, but to be able to say it, to admit it, to Hashem, not, nobody else, nobody else has done it. But to say to Hashem, Hashem, I'm owning up to something that I did because I'm admitting to you that I did something wrong. That's half of the tshuva process. That's half. I messed up, Hashem. But say it, verbalize it. Just thinking it is not enough. But who knows what we did wrong aside from us? He says, you want help to do tshuva, but you need to do the legwork also. He says, all I can do is to help I can prepare for you the proper path and to tell you this is the path this is the way to go by the way what do I mean the shvil, the derech, the nativ the path, the road, the alleyway there are a lot of people who are in the path of Torah they're just in the wrong alleyway you know you walk down Governor Drive so pretty much the neighborhood is a good neighborhood there's some places you go in the world the main street is nice, it's fine and the alleyway next to that street, though, can be where you'll get mugged, where you'll get hit in the face, or there's a bar over there, drunk people. Who knows what's over there? Not everybody who's going on the path of the Torah is in the right alleyway. They might be traveling west, but they're not going on the right roads. They, they think they are, because that's the same direction everybody else is going. But they have not individualized their road of observance. It has to be personal. 
השביל והנתיב עקום הוא, והולך בו יגיע לשאול התחתית והסדרה אחר כך מנצן. וזה הדרך השביל והנתיב ישר הוא, והולך בו יגיע זרועי השם ולתפארת הוד ותושבת ברח. זה I can tell you this road will take you straight to Gehenom. This road is a good for nothing road. That road will take you straight into the arms of Hashem that are outstretched and waiting for you. Let's remember, this is one of the heresies of Hasidus. Is they're not afraid to tell you, you're not coming to the king's palace. You're coming to Hashem's arms that are waiting to hug you. This is an uh, intimacizing of Judaism that has not been done, at least not in European Judaism, for a thousand years. In the Sephardic songs, you find a lot of love songs between Hashem and the Jewish community. In the Ashkenazi world, not so much. The Hasidim, because of their love for Kabbalah, and the Kabbalah is a text which is very intimate, brought back a certain, don't be so scared of Hashem. Ah, yes. Run to Hashem's arms. He's waiting to hug you. To That's Hashem. not a thing anybody would have told you 600 years ago. Talk to Hashem like he's your best friend. Very good. But the Hasidim is bringing out innovation here, which is why I'm happy for this innovation. Someone went, probably my wife. The Hasidim, we didn't make anything up. It, nothing's new about Hasidim. Listen, give yourself credit also. I know you want to always be mainstream, but credit is that they brought back a whole new spiritual revolution to the world that wasn't. V'chol av, melamed u madrich, and every father, teacher, educator, yechol rak l'tzavotchem u'liyaitzatchem. They can only tell you what to do and to advise you. U'vachem ha'davar taluim nishma elu. That's up to you already whether you're going to listen. So any Musar book you choose for Elu, any book you choose that's going to help you do Tishuva, you can read it. But it's up to you if you're going to follow it. That already nobody else can do for you. Lif'ol l'chanech et atzmechem b'darko v'mitzvato. To guide yourself according to that way. You can internalize every one of those concepts that you've studied and it will be good for you. And with Chaz Shalom you decide to resist and to rebel against Hashem. Who can help you? What can help you? I'm purposely not translating all the Kabbalistic concepts here. Who is going to save you from the, 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 the soul snatchers? that are going to take you away from Hashem. Chavayat Hashem should save us. You could read all the books you want, you could listen to all the Torah classes you want, but it's up to you to make the decision to make the right choices. Nobody else can do that for you. Only you can check the cracks in your soul and the holes in your heart. To find what, what is my problem, what is my flaw, and to fix it. ואנחנו רק על אודות איזה מהם לדבר, ותרופתן דבר ומהם תלמדו אתם, לכל דיניכם, ואיך נבקש למצוא אותם. אז זה לא רק על אתם. תפגר את מה שאתם צריכים להפגש. זה בסדר. זה משהו שאתם צריכים לדעת. אבל אני לא יכול לעזור לך עם זה. זה פרס שאתה צריך לדעת. אני לא יכול לעזור לך. אני יכול לעזור לך, אני יכול לעזור לך, אבל אתה צריך להגיד לי מה הבעיות האלה, כדי שאתה יכול לעזור לך. אני יכול לעזור לך. So is uh, yeah. So like this tishuva, like you said earlier, like just uh, wording it or talking about it to a shem, that's like a lot. But like, is there more? Like, do you have to talk to your rabbi or your rebbe about it and to like be accountable to it? I guess. What do you mean? Because he keeps saying like to like that's between you and a shem, you and a shem, or between just yourself. But then he says like. But if you don't tell me, I can't help you. Correct. Correct. Uh, not if you don't tell me, but if you don't apply what I'm... You're right. There is this. Obviously, you're not talking back to him. I'll tell you, like I mentioned in one of my other classes, I don't remember which one. You have to be wary who you share your other with. Yeah. Because some people might use it again. You know, there's a nice concept to have, but not everyone is as righteous as you would want them to be. But definitely for yourself to be honest with your flaws. And then I'll read you one last paragraph and you'll understand wh like which personality he's talking about. The first personality, Yeshnam and Ashim Gdoli Muktanim, there are great people, small people, there are a lot of people all across the spectrum. Shainam Margishim Chisaron Mkirbam. They don't feel any kind of Chisaron, uh, any kind of uh, flaw inside of them. They're flawless. Vaafim Abit Bisivrei Musar. And even if they read books of Musar, Shemida Zoba Zorahi, and they'll read laziness is bad, Lashon Hara is bad, hating people, all kinds of things they're going to read. They never make that connection. Oh, I have that problem. 
they read about the problems. You know when you see this in like Shalom Bayit classes? When the husbands and the wives are sitting together and the rabbi says, you know, there's a problem and you always see them do this. The wife and the husband, depending who they are, they go, see, 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 see talking to you. Yeah. Before you tap your spouse and say, the rabbi's talking about you, let me talking about me. Yeah, I'm the problem. It could be they have problems too, but right now my job is not his problem, it's my problem. There are many people, you'd be surprised, you say, and someone says, why don't you give a class about? I said, because the class that I'm going to give about that topic, the ones who don't have that problem, they'll agree with me. The ones who have the problem, they'll agree with me. But the ones who fix the problem, the, who need the problem to be fixed, it's not relevant to them. They don't even make that connection of always talking about me. It doesn't make it, it never happen. He references here the Rambam's introduction to psychology in Shmuel Pokim. He says, if you see a person who, when they read books of Musa, they feel no pain, like nothing changes inside of them, it's not a good sign. This is like a sick person. A person who's very sick in the hospital, in ICU, and they catch a cold, they don't even know. Sometimes they say, oh, this person in ICU, he got pneumonia. He didn't know he got pneumonia. Why? He's so busy with his heart attack. He didn't, he didn't realize that when a person has problems and then something happens and they don't pick up on those problems, it's because there's something much greater that's sick over there. He said, that's the worst sign that we have. That's a, like, help. This person needs to be rushed in the ambulance to the spiritual hospital. So that's what he's talking about. People who who are not being honest, not, maybe not even, into, not, not even conscious they're not being honest, but they're not the kind of person that when they study, that when they learn, that when they're when they're learning a book of Musa, then it changes them. It doesn't affect them because they don't think they have anything wrong. I'm a perfect angel of Hashem. And that's what needs to be fixed. And the next week, we're going to talk more about uh, uh, this topic.